shiny. <laughs> Bonjour. Welcome to the live stream edition of Cafe Day. Renee, James here. Join once again with the Stylist Show. Mr. Renee Dupree. Renee, you delivered again. Another great guest. Another great guest indeed. A man that I saw, I guess, two weeks ago in North Carolina. And before that, I think the last time we saw each other was in Germany, correct? I think you're right. Yeah. 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 So it's weird how the rest of the business works, man. You, you don't see each other for five years and you might see each other for two or three weeks straight. Then, well, here we are on the cafe, Mr. Yeah. Ken Anderson, AKA Mr. Kennedy, AKA Stud Muffin. <laughs> how you doing, pal? I'm great, man. You know, I was, I was telling people that I felt like I stepped into a portal, like a time warp. The other night when we after the show, yeah. I was sitting behind the driver. Chavo was in the middle, Sly was on the right, and you were in the passenger seat. And I was like, I had this flashback to 2007, right. 2008 when we go to the gym <clears throat> during the shows. We remember for a while they were letting us go to. Uh, we could actually check in at the building on TV day, and then they would let us go to the gym. Did they not like, do that anymore? No, somebody, while we were there, somebody got pulled over for speeding and went to jail for a little bit. And about 30 of us ended up being late to, to getting back. Do you remember this? No. I don't remember who it was, but somebody, somebody, you know, it wasn't unintentional, but somebody screwed it up for everybody. Like, Wow. So now we had a check and you got to stay there. Yeah. Then they... For a while there, like when I first started, we had to just stay. Right. Like if we checked in, we had to stay there. And then somebody talked to Johnny into allowing us to go to the gym since we weren't really doing anything until about three o'clock, anyways. And we had to be there at noon. Right. And then, uh, and then, yeah, it, it was fine until somebody ended up. They had to bail him out of jail because he was going like 20, 20 over. I mean, some states they just they arrest you right away, you know. Right. I know. It's crazy, man. The different different laws in different states. But the first time you and I met, if I'm not mistaken, was it 2005? Because I had already been on the like on the main roster for a, a year or two. And then you, I met you in OVW because you had the, the bleach blonde like goatee beard. Yeah. Um, I think we actually met at some tapings because I, I did some extra work. And I feel like I wrestled you and Conway, really, in a dark, in a, like a dark match or something like that. We had a a tag match, but it was a couple of years before I got hired. Okay, it's possible, yeah. man. You know how it is. It's like, yeah, between the the amount of people you meet and all the the concussions, man. Fuck, remember? That's the. I I, always, I don't know about you, but I I feel bad whenever I'll. I'll be at a show today and I'll shake somebody's hand and say, Hey, it's nice to meet you. And they'll say like, Oh yeah, we've met each other like five times. <laughs> right. It's not a, it's nothing personal. It's just like, I, I don't remember. Well, yeah. It's like that show we did in the North Carolina, right? Like you just meet guys in passing for like 10 seconds. Hey, how are you doing? So it's not like, okay. Like for example, you and I, we worked in the same company for years together and, and then you really develop a bond, but it would, you're just in and out. You just fucking meet so many people. You know? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's talk about, like, the beginning of your career, man. So Green Bay, Wisconsin, am I correct? Is that your home state where you grew up? Yeah. Yep. I, well, I grew up in, in a town called Two Rivers that was about 30. It's 30 miles away from Green Bay. Okay. When I got signed by WWE, I was, uh, I was living in Green Bay. And for some reason, I wanted everybody to know that I was a Green Bay Packer fan. I was real proud of that. So that's why I chose Green Bay, I think. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, and, and honestly, like going back, I I didn't realize like how cool the city that I actually grew up in was until like the last five, ten years. So I kind of wish I would have used that as my hometown, you know, my actual hometown. All right. So, like, at what age did you decide to, like, <clears throat> okay, this is it. I want to be a pro wrestler. Was it from a young age or? No. Kind of, no? I, I knew from a young age that I wanted to be in the entertainment industry. Like, 
I really enjoyed acting and stuff like that. But I didn't watch wrestling until I was, I think I was 21 when I watched my first episode of Monday Night Raw. And uh, it was just to, like, my, my buddy convinced me to watch because Austin was becoming really popular and he was a big Austin fan. And I I remember the only thing I recall from that night was Austin like driving to the ring in a pickup truck with a six pack of beer in his lap and just the whole the way that he carried himself. I was like, okay, this guy's pretty cool. <laughs> and then I started watching it every week just to see his segments. And then I got sucked in. Oh, wow, well, Undertaker's pretty cool and Kane's cool. And then, you know, pretty soon I'm in, in wrestling was so hot then that I would go to work and the guys that I worked with, that's all we would talk about. We'd call each other, you know, from different positions. I was a, I was a security guard at a nuclear power plant. So we'd go sit in these boxes for an hour and then you, somebody would come in and relieve you and you'd rotate and go to sit in a different box. And we, you know, we had phones in there and that's all we would talk about. Did you see raw the other night? Right. Right. And, uh, and I was at a party one night and somebody said, Hey, you can go to wrestling school. And I, I had never even considered like how do these guys learn how to do this? You know, I just thought it was completely something that I would never do. And uh, when I found out you could go to wrestling school, I went home and I looked it up on the internet. I found a wrestling school in Chicago and I reached out to him, just left him a message. And then that guy, knew of a guy in green bay who was starting up a wrestling school so he passed my info on to him and uh i went and did a tryout and i just i remember stepping in stepping foot in that crappy it was a 16 by 16 ring low rider yeah like a, two feet off the ground yeah and it had like the canvas was all ripped and there were patches of blood on it and duct tape and and the ropes were all saggy and wobbly. And I mean, it was uh, the ring was the shits. And I fell in love with it. And I was like, this is it. This is so, what you want to do, man. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. So how many guys were with, like, in the same class that, that you started with? I was the first guy in my class. I, that was the first guy that trained at that school. Like, he hadn't trained anybody else. I was I was his first. Okay. But I think by the by the time that I started having matches there was probably six other guys six other guys no did there any anybody that we know of or did it just get nope. Up? no okay. nobody nobody in that particular class um but you know uh do you know who silas young is yes silas young came out of it. yeah dinty moore too i uh i can't think of his name now he was dinty moore he, he wrestles in uh ring of honor okay I'm sorry. The name is, I'm used to like his old name. Right. But yeah. there were a couple guys that actually came out of the school that were, that were decent. Like I was lucky to find a trainer that while he hadn't gone anywhere, or those guys hadn't gone anywhere, hadn't worked in the WWE. They knew what they were talking about. Right. Right. Now, there were some other schools that were open at the time that had I called them, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now, you know, because right. I just, you don't know what you don't know and you don't know when you don't know it. Right. Right. So, I mean, but I was, I was lucky. I mean, now like you, you own and operate your own wrestling school. I mean, is that something you would tell like maybe other students from that are not, are in your area? It's like, you got to be trained by someone who knows what the hell he's talking about and someone who, you know what I mean? Got I got a name for herself and has accomplished something in the business because there's so many of these rinky dinky fly by night schools that just cash and grab take your money. You know what I mean? Yeah. So and I I think uh, you don't necessarily have to have made it to WWE or AEW or something like that, but you should take a look at the school and like I I think you can tell you can tell when somebody knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Versus somebody that's just going to take your money, you know, right. Um, right. look at the other students that have come out. Are the other students working all the time? Do they look like wrestlers? Right. Um, and I get people from time to time that will message me. I, I give my number out freely. And uh, 
I'll get people from all over the world that will message and say, Hey, I live in, you know, I live in Portland, Oregon or whatever. I live in Texas. I don't, I can't really come up to the twin cities, but can you help me? And I try to help everybody because I want to make sure that people, if they do get into the business, they get in the right way and go to Booker T school, go to, you know, the, the Dudley's guys like that. Mm, mm, mm. So let's go back to your career, man. So like, okay. So what years did you join the wrestling school? 99. 99. So how, yeah. how long till you start branching off and start doing shows? I, I trained for nine months every Sunday. Every and Sunday. every Sunday was like three or four hours. So it was a good session. Right. And then uh, um, I, I started having, I had my first match. And then from there, it was like, you know, for the first couple months, you only get a booking here and there. So I think my first two months in the business, I probably had three bookings that entire time. Wow. And then... And then, uh, I, like I said, I was doing the nuclear security thing, so I had to work every other weekend, and I was passing up some opportunities. Like a promoter would come to me and say, "Hey, can you do this date?" And, no, I got to work. Right. And uh, and then I just decided to move from that area over to the Twin Cities. The Twin Cities at the time, St. Paul and Minneapolis, had like ten different wrestling companies that were working regularly. And uh, I got a job as a personal trainer because I figured I, you know, that I don't have an excuse not to get to the gym. Right. And uh, and it worked out well. It, and it was like I could work Monday through Thursday. I packed my schedule like 10 a.m. until midnight every single day, Monday through Thursday. Yeah. And took as many clients. And then I had off every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to travel. I think – Personal training is probably the best job for an independent wrestler, right? Because, I mean, yeah. it fits in perfect with our lifestyle. we got to keep ourselves in shape. And then especially if you're – because uh, personal trainer, like you're like an independent contractor basically, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it fits perfect, yeah. The schedule, the schedule is super flexible, at least yeah. the place that I was at. I was at Valley Total Fitness. Right. And they were – when I started, I was like, hey, is there any way that I can work – four days a week and then have the, and sure, that's fine. You know, right. never had a problem with it, but yeah, it's like you continuously, you keep bettering yourself because you're in the gym, you're working with other trainers. You learn stuff from those trainers about nutrition and yeah. different exercises and stuff. So it was see, that's another thing. It's like, okay, yeah, we have to look physically, you know, the par, but proper nutrition helps so much with healing you know what I mean? Like when your joints are sore and your back is sore, if you have proper nutrition, you'll heal faster. That's what yep. I'm like. You know what I mean? If your diet is the shit, you just feel so much better when you're yeah when you're eating that way. When I eat like shit, I feel like shit. Right. Sorry, can you swear on here? Oh, you, you can do whatever you want, pal. We're pretty lenient here. You can say whatever you want. Okay, so boom, you're doing the personal training gig. You're starting to work little odd jobs. Boom, you're growing. When does uh? Was WWE always the goal, or was it just to have fun? Always, was always the goal. Okay, always from day one. Right. Um, I didn't tell anybody that because everybody was kind of there were there was a lot of negativity. Sorry, there was a lot of negativity. I think where people would, you know, I remember at the time everybody thought if you go and you do these dark matches. And you're just a jobber. That's all they're going to ever look at you as is a jobber. And I don't know. I just, I sensed that the landscape was changing. I didn't really know too much when I, when I broke in, but I, I just sensed that that was wrong. That if I go there and I do my job, which is to get somebody else over to make that guy look good if I do that well. And then, I go away and then I come back and they see that I've gotten better. I just right. thought I'm just going to keep sending tapes and I'm just going to keep knocking on the door. Okay. And eventually it worked out. It worked out for me. So, so, okay. What year uh, did you start doing darks? So I sent, I sent my first tape, my first year in the business. I had only been in for like eight months. Okay. And I sent, and I remember asking some people, you think I should do this? And 
no, you shouldn't. You definitely shouldn't. Not ready yet, right? Yeah. Because you're not ready, and they're gonna see that. And and I again, I was just like, well, if I'm not ready, they'll tell me, and then the next time they see me, I'll be a little more ready. There you go. <laughs> and uh, so I remember my very first tape that I sent out. There was a magazine that came out once a year that had all the promotions in the country. It had their um, their mailing addresses. Oh, yeah. So I got this, you know, where to send a tape to for WWE if you were trying to get in. So I remember I sent my very first tape. Kevin Kelly called me back and said, hey, I saw your tape. I liked it. And uh, he was the one that was in charge. Did you, did you have any dealings with Kevin Kelly? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he just said, well, I'd like to book you for as an extra for Raw and SmackDown. They were coming through Milwaukee and Chicago. Okay. We'll pay you 500 bucks for the two days, which is crazy. You know, good right. money. Right. And uh, and then, yeah, a couple of weeks later, I was standing in catering behind Stone Cold Steve Austin. Trying to, you know, you, the, another thing that was fortunate about my trainers was they always told me, like, don't, you got to act professional. Yeah. Once you're in the business, like, you don't ask anybody for pictures. Don't ask for autographs and stuff like that. So, right, um, yeah, very important. You want to, don't be a mark, basically, right? Don't be a mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bro. yeah. So, so this fuck. If it's Kevin Kelly calling you up, it must be around 02. No, I think it was 01. Oh, or, wow. it might have been. It might have even been 2000. Because I holy shit, it was like late 2000, early 2001. Our wow. SA Rios was my first dark match. Wow. Okay. So shit. So you you were doing darks for several years before you like finally got five years, five and a half years. Damn. Okay. So where does Davari? Because I know you and Davari are tight as thick as thieves. Where does he come into the picture? <laughs> so so uh, I met him. At, you know, like I said, I started working shows in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Right. I met him on one of the shows, and I believe he was sixteen or seventeen at the time. He started real young, yeah. He did. In fact, he, he tells a funny story about how, like, his dad didn't want him to do it and told him, I'll buy you a Corvette if you quit the business. And he chose the business over the over the Corvette. At, a, at like, 15, 16 years old, he didn't care. Right. Um, but, yeah, so we met there, and then we just – I found that he was somebody that was just as hungry as I was and was willing to go out of his way. He was willing to make the long drives and yeah. send tapes. And every time we would be together, we would be like, what are they looking for? What, what can we do differently? Yeah. We always tried to work like, like the WWE style so that when I got there, it wasn't, it wasn't foreign to me. Right. That's smart. First, a lot time of people go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think a lot of people don't learn the, that style until they actually get there, if they get hired. I can honestly say I wasn't ready for TV-style WWE matches at 19 when I got there. Cause, I can imagine. You no, know, yeah. Because OVW wasn't teaching that. Rip Rogers was teaching old-school wrestling, right? And just, you know, basic psychology. But then when you got to the main roster, it's go, 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 100 miles an hour. You know, a lot of no selling, especially even at that time. Now it's even worse. I mean, now I think you'd agree that Jesus Christ, they're hitting DDTs and standing right up two seconds later, right? But uh, yeah. I was going to say the first time I met Devar, <laughs> I was so impressed because he and I are around the same age. And he's Persian, correct? Yeah. So fucking for his finish, he did a dive, but he had a Persian rug. And he the magic carpet ride. Yeah, and I'm thinking that I'm like, wow, that's pretty fucking, you know that. That's clever, you know. Yeah, he's giving it. He brought the rush, so that's that's the first time. But he was really into to working out, and I think he's still he's still pretty jacked, right? He is. Yeah. He looks great. Yeah. So okay, so when did you finally get the first contract? First contract was 2005. 2005. Um, so 2000, yeah, 2005, late 2005. And uh, I remember uh, Davari had gotten hired. He called me one day and uh, said, hey, I just, I'm just do the first person I'm calling. I just wanted to let you know that Dr. Tom just called me. And uh, 
they're they're offering me a contract. I'm going to Louisville, and I was like, you know, so so excited for him. And so he was there for about a year, I think, maybe okay. six months to a year. He had spent some time down in Louisville, I believe, and then and then they put him on the road with Mark Capani uh, with uh, Muhammad Hassan. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so then at the same time, I was going and doing more dark matches. Dreamer had taken over in that position. Yeah. By that time. And uh, I, I would go, I remember I would go to the tryouts or whatever we call them tryouts, right? Like it was just Monday Night Raw or SmackDown. And at, at the time, they would let the local guys get in the ring for a couple, like an hour or two right. at some point during, during the day. And there would be two guys in the ring, and they'd just get in there and start chain wrestling each other. And I remember Devari like elbowing me. Going, they don't care about that. Like they don't care if you can chain wrestle. That's not what they're looking for. And I was like, well, "What are they looking for?" He's like, "Character. You got to show them character." And so he really helped me out in that regard. And then at one point, um, I'm standing on the outside. Devari was with me. He would, and he had geared up that day so he could get in the ring. And Fit Finley was just going like, you and you, get in the ring, give me five minutes. And he pointed at me and Davari. And we got in a ring. And Davari and I had wrestled each other so many times on the indies that we knew each other's stuff inside and out. Yeah. And he just said, listen to me. Listen to me, kid. You know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he he called a good, basic, solid little match. We We did our stuff. I was able to get my character in. And Arn Anderson pulled me aside that day, and he was like, uh, I don't say this often, but, like, the next time they're hiring and they ask us for our input, I'm going to put your name in the head. So, uh, And then Heyman had done the same thing. Dreamer was, was helping out, too. And so one day, all of those things just converged. I remember Davari called me on a – I think it was a Friday, and he said, hey, they just hired seven guys from Louisville, so be ready. They could be calling you any day. And I waited until Wednesday of the next week. Just every time my phone rang, I'd be like, yeah, I'd answer it. It would be a bill collector. Um, <laughs> and then I finally called Dreamer. I would always call him on a Wednesday because Monday, Monday was raw. Tuesday was SmackDown. And then he would get back to the office on Wednesday around noon. And I'd call him in that early afternoon. And uh, I called him, and he didn't – like, if he was busy, he would just say, I got to I gotta call you back. Right. Um, I can't talk right now, whatever. And then he never would call me back. But um, that's just how it is, you know, in the business. Yeah. And he said – I remember he said, hang on a second. I need to, I need to get, grab something here. And I was like, this is different. This is different, you know. And then he came back, and he said, hey, I've been trying to get a hold of you but your number is disconnected. And I pulled, you know, no, no, it's not. He said, oh, is your number blah, 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 blah. No. I, said, no. I said, no. He goes, oh, well, I've been calling the wrong number. You know, that monotone voice that he yeah. And uh, he's he probably said, ribbing you. Probably ribbing you. Yeah, probably. Well, it's possible. Yeah, but he said, I've been trying to call you and I, I haven't been able to get a hold of you. Yeah. And uh, he said, I was about an hour away from calling the next person on the list. Wow. Like, so yeah, he said, you know, I got you a job. And then I, I, um, Devari, he had told me that he wasn't sure if he was going to send me to deep South cause they were just opening deep South, but it wasn't actually open yet. Right. Or if I was going to go to OVW, he said, I'll tell you, I'll, you'll find out in the next couple of weeks. And Damari was like, dude, they go to go to Louisville, ask him, beg him to send you to Louisville. Because it's already established. You don't know. Deep South could last a, a couple months. And it did, right? It only lasted right. about a year. Yeah, not very long. So he he helped kind of convince Dreamer if uh, and, and Dreamer finally agreed, hey, you can go to Louisville. And I went down there and got I, I I think I called the place that Davari was living at and I just rented an apartment okay. sight unseen and drove down there two weeks later 
And uh, I called Dreamer and said, hey, I'm here in Louisville. Can I stop by OVW and introduce myself? And he's like, are you there looking for an apartment? I said, no, I live here. And he goes, you live there already. And he goes, well, you can start tomorrow then. And the next day was a TV taping. So I went and introduced myself. And I remember I knocked on the back door and the first person to open the door was Bobby Lashley. And <laughs> oh, I thought, oh my God, I'm fucked. Right. See that big guy fucking answering the door. Yeah. This is my competition here. So who was doing the train? That was Al at that point or was it Lance Storm? It was back and forth between Al and Lance. So oh, Lance. Oh. because I think Lance was still living up in Canada. Yeah. So he would come down for like a week or two weeks. And then they would they would switch and then Al would come in for two weeks. So it was actually kind of cool that I got two different training styles right out of the gates. Oh yeah. Yeah. See that that uh at one point in time they had Memphis, they had uh Louisville with OBW, and then they had Heartland Wrestling Association in Cincinnati. It's a shame they couldn't have kept that going longer. Because what a great, you know, because you go to, say, Memphis for six months, then go to Louisville for six months, then you go to, like, Cincinnati for six months, and then rotate it, and then do the do it again as as a good guy, and then as a bad guy, right? Yeah, yeah. I think, but it's I think they like tried. Old to, territory. Right. But, fuck, man, I think they had too many headaches with dealing with different promoters, maybe. I don't know exactly what the story is behind it, but it didn't work out, but. Now yeah. Back to you. Uh, one question I want to ask you because we got to get to these super chats, man. Because we got holy Christ, you're a popular, you're a popular guy again. Where the hell did you learn how to speak so good? Is that just um, natural? Yeah, I kind of think I really took to when I was in high school. Like speech class was my favorite. Okay. And I did some some play acting. I don't know if you guys are familiar with forensics, but forensics in high school is like. Uh, it's it's a competition where you can you can do speech there's play acting there's monologues you know debates right and i did that every year so like that was just something that, and that was something that i gravitated towards when i started in the business i was like i wanted to be like like the guys that i looked up to austin rock yeah the talkers yeah. And so any chance that I got working for a promotion, I would always cut a promo yeah. or, or do a backstage, you know, some of the, some of the places had like little backstage sketches and stuff that we would do. And, and I just kept, you know, just kind of working on that. And I kept working on, I would have some basic stuff in my, I always call it, I tell my students, like, have your back pocket promo ready so that if you go to Raw or SmackDown as an extra and they just say, like, cut me a heel promo right now, you can just go, oh, yeah. And sort exactly. of, you know, exactly. some basic stuff where you can plug in some different names, but it's kind of generic. But yeah. And that's sort of what I did. And that was ultimately, that was the straw that broke the camel's back because on the day I was, I was at OVW just kind of wasn't really sure if I was coming or going and Paul Heyman came in and that sort of changed my life. He really saw something and, and pushed me. And, uh, and then five weeks later I was, I was going to get a tryout with Funaki at a SmackDown taping in Columbus, Ohio. And That's where I had my first match. Really? Yeah, Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Canyon. Who'd you who'd you work? Canyon. Nice. Chris Canyon, yeah. How did yours go? Yep. Did you end up going with Funaki? Yeah. I, I did. And the thing was, is like all day it was gonna be a dark match. And Funaki was gonna hit me with the super kick, one, two, three. Yeah. And I went into uh Brooklyn Brawler, you know, Brawler's got was doing the he would do the backstage uh like pre tapes and stuff like that. Yeah. So I went in by him and they had requested, the office had requested that I cut a promo. So I remember standing there and I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. And Brawler kept saying, maybe, maybe say something like this. And he would like give me some ideas. And then 
I would almost have it. And then he would go, or, or maybe you do <laughs> this. And he would fuck me up. And I finally was like, I got it. I'm just going to go. And I, I, you know, I kept it super simple, but I hit my, my lines that I always hit. And, yeah. um, and I remember he said, I'm going to tell Vince that was really good. And he, he ended up saying something to Vince that day. And I was in gorilla position, getting ready to go up for my dark match. And Vince walked by to go up and sit down. And uh, Dave Lagana came around the corner and he said, there's, there's been a change. And I was like, you know, in my head, I thought, ah, they cut, they cut my match. No big deal. Um, but he said, this is going to be a televised match. You're going to be on velocity now. Um, we need to come up with a finisher for you because you're going over and welcome aboard. And he stuck out his hand and wow, that was, yeah. And I went out and I uh, had a great, what I think was a solid showing and I came back through the curtain. I got the thumbs up from Vince came back through and Arn was like, you got yourself a job kiddo. Uh, and and then it was like, you know, overnight, you know how I, you go from OVW, which is just a glorified indie to you're on the road five days a week. Yeah. You know, traveling the world. Crazy. It's a big change in, uh, in lifestyle, it's a big change in um, standard of living because you're making a lot more money. Yeah. Uh, I don't it know. Didn't happen. Go ahead. It, it didn't happen right away, though. I remember the first couple of months being on the road and not having a pot to piss in or a window to throw out, throw it out of. And I remember at some point I was rolling with Davari and. Uh, uh, there was a couple other guys that I knew from OBW and Batista pulled me aside and he was like, nothing against those guys, but like, you need to get in the car with like a Chris Benoit or somebody like that, you know, like you, you need to get in with somebody that you can learn something from. And so I took his, I took his message to heart and I asked Benoit and I started, started rolling with, with Benoit and Eddie, but at the time I wasn't making any money and they would, I went from sharing rooms at Red Roof Inn where I only had to come up with like, you know, 20 or 30 bucks a night to my own hotel rooms at $150 a night times four nights. Right. And I was, I was struggling, man. Yeah. You're spending a lot more money, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, James, should we go to the super chats now? Cause they packed up or should we what do you want um, to do? Yeah, we'll go to the super chats. I've got some questions later, but we'll get some of these super chats out of the way. Yeah. Um, any good Shelton Benjamin or Bobby Lashley stories? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I'll, let me let me let me think about that for a little bit. And... Okay. Oh, so you're trying to think what you can and can't say? Yeah. <laughs> I get you. I got you. I got you. Think about that one. We'll get back to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Weren't you supposed to be McMahon's kid? Wasn't that the whole deal? I was. I was, and then I got in trouble um, with the signature pharmacies thing. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I remember one time. Stephanie, it was after TV. Stephanie came up to me and she's like, "Hey, Vince has an idea, and he wants. I, I, I'll let him run it by you because he's excited about it." And I went in and he kind of laid it out for me. You know, they're gonna say that I have a son, but I don't know who it is. And then there's gonna be a big investigation for several weeks, and then, and then once that is revealed, who knows? It could last six months. It could last a year. Whatever, we'll, we'll take it as we see it. Um, yeah, and then literally the week before they're going to do the reveal in Green Bay. It just so happened that we were going to be in Green Bay. And uh, I, I remember I got home that day from TV, landed here in, in Minneapolis, got home. And as I'm walking up my steps, I get a message from... Johnny's secretary, Johnny Ace's secretary, saying, 
hey, Vince needs to see you in Stanford today. Go back to the airport. We're booking your flight. We'll give you all the info. So I literally turned around, went back to the airport. And I remember thinking, like, here we go. You know, like, this is good. This is going to be good. And uh, I got to Stanford, got to the building, and there were nine other people there, or eight other people there. Were you, were you one of them? No, not no. me. Fuck. <laughs> there was eight other people there, and somebody said, I don't think this is good. <laughs> they had gotten like a hint from somebody else and then i remember i remember so we still at this point have no idea why we're there right <clears throat> there's nine of us sitting in the lobby outside of vince's office and one by one they start calling us in and we had all like made a pact okay first person that goes in will come out and kind of smarten everybody else up to what's what's happening Right. I remember Edge went in first, and he came out four minutes later, and his head was down, and he goes, it's not good. I can't say anything, but it's not good. And then he he wow. walked out. So now it's even worse. And then, yeah, I went in the office and, you know, that whole thing, that whole fiasco. Mm. And the thing was, it was like, wow, well, yeah, you don't have to get into anything you don't want to get yeah. into. You know what I, mean? I just I, I had a doctor's prescription and uh he asked me about it. He's like, you know, we, we instituted the wellness policy here and on this date and it says that you received these drugs, these steroids. And uh I, they had told us if you have a doctor's prescription, it'll be okay. So that's what I did. And it turns out that also, in that wellness policy, it said that you weren't allowed to get your medicine from uh, an online pharmacy. And the doctor that I was going through was getting it from an online pharmacy. I had no idea. But... Oh. <clears throat> and at the time, Congress was really, like, coming down hard on WWE. The Big time. Uh, Big you know, time. The media was. So Vince just said, my hands are tied. I'm sorry. And he. He said, I'm, I'm suspending you for 30 days and I'm fining you $10,000. Yeah. yeah. Which brings us to our next question. <laughs> you still use signature for wrestling? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not even sure if they're still in existence. Right. They must know, suck, man. Did they get a lot of heat over that? So, Do you know why I, the story that I heard – Okay. I heard the reason why everybody everybody started looking at signature pharmacies was there was a baseball player who was prescribed a year's worth of growth hormone, and he went to a pharmacy and tried to have it filled like the entire, the which, entire year. Which normally a doctor, if it's legit, the doctor will give you like a month or two at a time, right? And you have to keep going back and yeah. getting getting checked. Right. And this guy just wrote his client uh it was a baseball player somebody in major league baseball tried to get one year's prescription filled at a pharmacy and then they started wait a minute here and they started looking at everything else what's going on yeah uh yeah there's other stuff you have to understand like the people watching now there's a lot of stuff that that goes on that we can't talk about but it gets really heavy as far as these online doctors and stuff we had joined the bull on here uh was it Last two weeks ago, James? Well, a couple, couple of weeks ago, yeah. And, and uh, there was that signature pharmacy, but he had a doctor in Arizona that was also prescribing guys like Benoit and Eddie. And, and then there was doctors, Aston, that got busted in, in Georgia, too. Yeah. So there was all kinds of different – fuck, man. When I first started, it was a different, it was a different landscape than it is today. I mean, yeah. it was way different. Guys were – I, I remember hearing those guys talk about getting their prescriptions filled and stuff. And I'm glad I never went, you know, did that. Mm, mm, mm. Memories of your way. last ride match with Taker. Um, there was a funny moment. So during the match, I throw Taker off the scaffolding. Like we go up and he tries to choke slam me off of it. And 
during the day, I'm standing there with Taker, Michael Hayes, and Vince. And we're looking up at the scaffolding, and Vince looks at Taker, and he goes, it'd be far more impressive if you went off that thing, Take. Because he was initially going to choke slam me off it or something. We're trying to figure out how to get there. It would be far more interesting and impressive if you went off there, Take. And Taker looked at him. And then Vince said, do you want me to go up there and do it first? Wow. And then Take's like, no, I got it. I'll do it. Wow. So, and then the funny thing was, is, I mean, he literally, it, it was a high scaffolding. I remember getting up there and, and thinking, holy shit, you know, this is high. It had to be like 20 feet off the ground. And uh, they had two giant mattresses, two crash pads that Taker got to land on. Okay. And the jib camera like comes around and looks straight down at him. And you see him laying on these two mattresses. And I could hear Vince, because gorilla position is right there. Right. God damn it, get a different shot, get a different shot. Oh. And that thing, if you watch it today, it's you see Taker laying on two mattresses for like the longest period of time. And then they go back to it at some point. It's it pretty bad. Dude, I don't know if you were with the company. I don't think you were on this was 2003. It's when um, Shane was feuding with Kane. Okay. And it was on mm -hmm. Raw. And Kane ended up giving Linda McMahon a tombstone on the, like, the stage. But he, she missed, like, her head missed by this much, like a foot. Yeah. Obvious. But he was trying to protect. I mean, she was like a 60 some year old woman at the time. He was trying to fight. Right. Right. Vince was livid after because that's what closed the show, and Vince was so pissed off, man. Just cussing and swearing, God damn. Like this is his wife, and right. like, it's just everything for television, man. Everything has to look good. Doesn't matter what. Well, you've been around. You know how he is. Uh, Your entrance always annoyed this. Well, gee, thank you, Dark Knight. Never understood how I got over. It's not like you have a bad. At well, listen. Dark Knight Returns, we love you. You're great, but please show some respect. No, that. it's okay. I, hey, I agree. I just I was in the right place at the right time. My voice annoys me. So, <laughs> oh shit. And oh, yeah. I, huh? Kevin Conroy. Do you know who that is? Batman. The, yeah, and his voice. I wasn't a fan of it until like. Just a couple of years ago, like I, I always hated his rendition of Batman, but I, it's it's grown on me definitely. Mm. Kennedy remind me so much of LA Knight now because they are both stars and great at promos and have jealous haters backstage to try to hold them back. Well, do you want to get into that, Ken? Or are we yeah, just going? I first of all, I think uh, that dude is super talented. He is. I remember working with him at NWA briefly, oh, yeah. and I thought like nobody in the business can touch this guy in the mic right now. And that was that was a couple of years ago. Um, but the thing about the jealous haters in the back, you know what? Like, I nobody held me back in my career. I held myself back. I seriously take full responsibility because, um, and. and it wasn't until just a few years ago. So I really had a chip on my shoulder for a long time after I got fired from WWE. And I blamed other people for my downfall. It's like I wasn't doing what I needed to do. And uh, had I been doing the right things all along, I would have never been in a position where one person could have that much influence over my career. You know what I mean? Like, right. if had I been doing all the right things, even if those guys would have said, I, he's this he's the shit or you know he's un, unsafe vince would have said shut the fuck up like right, right and wouldn't have listened to him but but there was a reason why vince listened to him and i think that my name was uh he heard my name in enough negative situations and right. he said like cut i'm done with it so yeah, yeah. And i think the fact that you can come to terms with that and you understand that makes you that much more of an asset as a trainer because you can teach the guys what not to do and yeah. why. And that's a very, very important thing that 
needs to be taught in our, our business, you know, not yeah, in the ring, of course, and all that stuff, but also the back 85% is backstage, Ken. You know that. That's one of the best Johnny Ace impersonations I've ever heard. Thanks. Who <laughs> came up with the idea of the mic coming down during the yeah, I love that Kennedy's entrance. Was there ever a malfunction where the mic came down at the wrong time or hit you in the head? There was a couple times where I'd miss it. <laughs> and they towards the like like for the first few months they, they would mess with me if i ever did it on a house show which was rare they would screw with me a little bit where they would like they it would come super slow so i'd be standing there waiting for it and then they would and then they would drop it really fast <laughs> there was a time on raw i think somebody posted it not too long ago of they dropped that mic super fast and I just knock it, and it goes swinging. <laughs> and I said, I meant to do that. You meant uh, to do it, yeah. But I don't remember. This kills me, too. I, I can never remember the writer. Because when I was there, when you were there, the, the writing room was like a revolving door, right? There was oh, constantly. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. It was one of the. One of the toughest jobs in, in the world, I think, in the entertainment industry is being a wrestling writer. To come up with 52 weeks of SmackDown and 52 weeks of Raw and pay-per-views and like online content on top of it. What a crazy job. Dealing with Vince McMahon and his fucking rewrites and the meetings at 2 o'clock in the morning at the hotel. These stories yeah. I'm hearing, man, are crazy. The stress. Very stressful. But uh, it was one of the writers that suggested it. And um, I think it was like my fourth or fifth week uh, actually on TV when they started doing it. And the first night, it was like uh, just a, if you go back and you watch, I don't remember who I wrestled that night, but it was just a normal microphone tied upside down that came down from the ceiling. And then the next week they got the, the shiny one. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, so Ken... Um, if you never watch my show, I usually have to take a piss about five, ten times. So I'm gonna go, and J James here is gonna read this, and he's so he good. Okay. <laughs> Surprise! It's 47 minutes. This is actually a record for Renee. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you, Ben. Question for Ken: When you worked in ICW, what was it like working with Joe Hendry? And did you know before the match he was gonna do a Pokemon parody song about you? I had no idea. First of all, I loved that that time in ICW. I really enjoyed it. Um, the crowd was just incredible there. It's one of the better independent crowds that I've ever been in front of. Um, I had no idea. They just said he he does these funny parody videos, and I think the first time I saw it, they just played it up on the on the Tron, hmm. and I didn't know what to, I didn't know how to react like. You know, it's kind of silly, but looking back on it and seeing all of his other videos that are like that, they're they're really smart. They're really well yeah. done. I love it. Yeah. I at the time, I just at the time I didn't know how to react to it. I was just like, it was so, you know, out of the box. But yeah, like the he's a good guy. At one point during the match. And this was totally unintentional. I think I, I ran into it. He was making his comeback, and he hit me with, like, a clothesline, say, clothesline, elbow, and then it was going to be a big boot. And for whatever reason, he kicked me right in the center of the chest, and I it knocked the wind out of me. And I had to tell him, to like, don't touch me, don't touch me, don't touch me. That's like uh... – Question here from Sean and G. Uh, opinion of Randy Orton? I think he's one of the best in the business. Period. Of all time. His timing, his selling is just it's incredible. Um, and again, that was uh, that was somebody that I blamed for, for my downfall. And uh, I just that's not that's not the case. No. It's 
like Renee said, it's great for, you know, you can look back at it and like, right, some of this was my own fault and you've grown leaps and bounds from it. And like Renee said, now that you've got your own school, you can teach this to your students. I think it's such a great progression you've made. I think, you know, hopefully it helps me in parenting too, because I've got two kids that are nine years old now that, well, same, <laughs> you know, so yeah, being able uh, to uh, own own things. Yeah. Yeah. Parenting is not easy. <laughs> uh, and hello. Thank you. I was first in Somalia in 2007, and the amount of kids and adults that pretended to sound like Mr. Kennedy was insane. Really? That's incredible. Um, I was, a few years ago, I was working out at my gym here in Minnesota, and I saw a guy, you know, I'm sure Renee will be able to speak to this. When you see, you, you can sometimes tell when somebody recognizes you like when they're a wrestling fan and this guy um, just had this look about him and he kept looking at me and I was like, I'm, I'm assuming he's a wrestling fan. So I just, I said hi to him and he came up to me and he said that he was from Cambodia wow. originally and that his family would walk like a couple hours every week, one night a week to watch wrestling. And it was just like, this crazy moment where you realize what a what a reach this business has to the rest of the world. So it was a cool moment. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing when you do look at it like that. Like like you said, how much of a reach it's got. Like Cambodia. Well, um, here's a good question. I would like to, and me personally, I'd like to know which version was your favorite. Uh, thoughts on the entrance music because. You had two. You had like the original, then there was one that was a bit more sped up. Mm -hmm. I prefer that one. Um, I my favorite music of all time is my TNA music, though. Oh so, yeah, yeah, that was a great song. Which, which I still use to this day. And uh, Dale Oliver was the guy that made that that song. That's right. Yes. Speaking of TNA, you got a great push in TNA. Obviously, you won the world championship a few times. What was your relationship with Hulk Hogan like in TNA? I had a great relationship with him. Um, you know, I think that he and Eric Bischoff had a big hand in getting me hired there in the first place. Hmm. Because my, one of the first things that I did when I got fired from WWE was I did Hulk Hogan did a tour of Australia. That's right. We did like five five shows, I want to say, five different cities, four or five different cities, and um, just had a good time, got to know them a little bit, and uh, and so both of those guys really helped me get my foot in the door at TNA. You worked um, a lot with uh, Jeff, um, you know, you're tagging uh enigmatic assholes so i remember that fondly <laughs> yeah. and obviously you feuded for the belt as well what was it like working with jeff because you, you were basically married in that company yeah one of my favorites of all time to work with I, people will ask me from time to time who's your favorite who's the best person you've ever worked with and it's super hard to, to nail that one down but jeff is definitely in that picture mm. of my favorites um the cool thing about jeff was he was, he's, everything was very simple, but at the same time, he was very innovative and always coming up with interesting ways of getting cut off um, and making his opponent look good. Jeff Hardy, I, I tell my students this all the time. One of the things Jeff would always tell me was you shine when you sell. Like, and it's, it's really true that a baby face, you know, is made if he's selling and he was so good at that we got some breaking news here i don't know if you follow the uh internet wrestling news ken not really we're not really well word on the street is can you read that triple h and no i can't read stephanie mcmahon separated and considering divorce 
Holy shit. Breaking news here on the cafe. <laughs> I don't know. I tell everybody, believe nothing of what you hear and half of what you read. So that could just be, yep. a but sorry to interrupt the interview, but no, no, no. That's, huh? Interesting. What, what's your thoughts on that, dude? Did you ever get along with the son-in-law and the, the queen? Um, or the princess? I, Stephanie was so sweet to me from day one. Me too. I always had a really good relationship with her. I always felt like she was very sincere and genuine. Um, not so much with Hunter at the time, mm. but again, that that's on me. Like I wasn't giving him any reason to do backflips over me, you know? Right. Um, yeah. I don't know. I never, there was times where he was cool and then, I don't know, maybe I was too young. I don't know. You know, it's kind of hard now. Like, okay. He'd have been 32, 33 at the time, right? So if, when I was 33, trying to have a conversation with a 19-year-old, I just want to, like, slap him in the face sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so where are we at with these questions, dude? James. Uh, we're here. What's the frequency? What's Kevin? the frequency, Kenneth? That's an REM song, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I haven't heard that in forever. Yeah. Got one here. Uh... <laughs> Where we at? CM Punk Saga. The backstage drama around him and his firing. A surprise to you. Big fan of your work. WWE and TNA. What's your thoughts on old Punky Bruce? Did you get along with him? I did. I didn't at first. But when we were when we were on the indies, I didn't really care for him. And right. um, we had a sit down one time. And uh, Paul Heyman brought us together over sushi and just kind of like... You know, because I, I wasn't a huge fan of his. And I had kind of expressed that to Paul. And Paul was like, you just, you, you got to get to know him a little better. And and I just, yeah, he's uh, he's grumpy. But that's just kind of the way he is, you know. Um, I, I had good experiences with him from that point moving forward. So, um, I don't know. It's just unfortunate that. Stuff like that's got to happen. Uh, I hate when it sucks when backstage politics takes over. Like it should be about the storylines and, and that stuff versus backstage you, politics. You know? Would you agree that the backstage bullshit takes the fun out of it? It does. It it's really like, does. Like the greatest feeling in the world is going out there for, you know, 15, 20, whatever minutes you got, 30. Fuck, getting to feel the crowd and you know, boom, trying to blow the roof off the place. But when you got the shit backstage, you just oh, and eighty five percent backstage. So it's just like, dude, fuck, <laughs> it takes the fun out of it. It really Mr. does. Kennedy, yeah. Did you ever meet The Rock? Would you have been cool to see a match between you and The Rock? Were you around, old Dewey Johnson? I was not a whole lot. Um, he was there when I was doing my, you know, when I was coming up trying to get a job. Yeah. So he was there a lot. And I remember there were a few times where he would go out of his way to come up, to come up to us and ask us how we were doing and, you know, actually have a little bit of a conversation. And he didn't have to do that at the time. He was the top guy in the company. And so I always thought that was cool. I always thought that I remember one time being at a, uh, it was a Monday night raw taping it was it was Raw or SmackDown, and it was in Milwaukee, and it was MLK Junior Day, right? It was Martin Luther King Junior's birthday, and uh, he he started off the show with the with this promo, and it, it, his stuff was always live because he would always do the crowd interaction, you know. In five seconds, they'll be chanting the Rock's name, right? And uh, and then he would feed off the crowd, and I remember I I used to watch him backstage and he would get a script early in the day and i would see him up against the wall like the you know, mouthing saying it and, and then i would see him with pat patterson and he would be going over it with pat he'd be he'd be hitting pat with it and then pat would give him some feedback and then he'd be back up against the wall or in a corner somewhere else and he was just constantly running through it he would do that all day and then on this day they said you know in three two 
and he fucking went. And it first of all, it was a sellout at the monitor. Every person that could be there yeah. was there. And he hit just the – it was an amazing promo. And uh, he hit his tagline at the end and walked off. And I remember Amy Dumas, Lita, saying – Follow that one, boys. You know, like it was just a hell of a way to start the show off. He was just, he was so good at what he did because he practiced the hell out of it. He, he really worked on it, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, by 2002, because I was there for his last match before he really took off to Hollywood, right? It was against uh, Goldberg. And, um, but he'd always come back, you know, sparingly here and there for it. And he never missed a beat. It, if anything, he, he got better each time. You know, I don't know if it was a Hollywood thing or what, but like usually like it's like almost ring rust, right? You don't do it for a while, cutting promos or whatever. It's like you're rusty, but he was fucking, he got better. Amazing. Yeah. As you tell him. I don't believe he had a match the entire time that I was with the company. He was there. I don't remember if, if he inducted his dad into the Hall of Fame or if he got inducted into the Hall of Fame. It was like WrestleMania 22, I think he was there. Dead. It was his dad, right? Yeah. That was the only. That was like the first time that I met him, and that was, you know, from the time that I was in the company, that was the only time I ever saw him at, at an event. Yeah. Yeah, man. Always, always in shape. Always just. Uh, you want to read this one, there, Jameson? Uh, yep, another question for Ken. Thoughts on Professor Mike Tanay and Don West getting inducted into the Impact Wrestling Hall of Fame, and do you have any stories about them? Uh, those guys. Don West um, was, when I was doing tryouts, I would also do tryouts for TNA. So I'd go out there and do dark matches. Um, and I remember Don West, when I was a kid, Don West was working for QVC late at night and he was selling baseball cards and stuff like that. And our family is a huge, you know, huge Packer fan family. And uh, one night my mom came into my room at like three o'clock in the morning, Ken, Ken, wake up. And it was Don West selling this Green Bay Packer helmet that was signed by all the Packers. Um, and uh, And she ended up buying it and then like years later when i went down and i did a dark match and don west would come around and ask for some some info because unlike wwe who didn't really care and this is not a complaint it's just like when you were doing dark matches for wwe they weren't talking about the the local guys at all you know like they didn't care it was surprising that they would even mention your name during the the commentary but tna would ask specifics you know like Where'd you go to school? Who trained you? That kind of stuff. And I told Don that story. And so like the very first match that I ever had on, it wasn't Impact, whatever their show was at the time, TNA. Don tells that story. So, Wow. He, he passed away, right? He did recently. Wow. That's sad. Just you a know, good brother. Somebody that everybody backstage loved him, you know? Right. Uh, that sucks. Former Manti resident and UWGB grad. Nice. So Manitowoc and Two Rivers are right next to each other. Okay. So there's kind of a rivalry between Carp, Carp Town and Skunkville. <laughs> uh, what's difficult to do your finisher on Hornswoggle off the ladder? See, I've never seen any of this stuff because what year so, would this been? It was WrestleMania 23. Okay, I was, I, was in, I was in rehab. Go ahead. Ford, Ford Field. Yeah. Okay. So they wanted me to hit Hornswoggle with something, and we were trying to figure out what that could possibly be. Right. And it was Hornswoggle that said, hey, you know, I was trying to give him like a power bomb off the ladder or something like that. And it just, the dude weighs, like, he weighs as much as the big show. <laughs> 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 And uh, he actually came up with it. He, he think you could get me up for your for your thing, and so we tried it. You know, 
the, the cool thing about WrestleMania is you have like five days beforehand to plan yeah. out your matches and everybody gets together and you get to try some different stuff. And yeah. They had crash pads. They had ladders of all different shapes and sizes. So we got up there and tried it, hit it. And uh, it ended up being like, you know, besides me grabbing the briefcase at the very end of the match, it was like one of my most memorable moments in my career was giving Hornswoggle that, that finisher off the ladder. And the funny thing was, you know, we talked to each other when we were in the ring. Yeah. And uh, I hit him with that thing, and he rolled out onto the apron under the one of the turnbuckles. And I couldn't check on him. And... But a couple minutes later, a couple minutes went by, and then I finally, I was near him, and I was like, hey, man, you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm good. He, like, he was just. Okay, nothing. <laughs> he had uh, some health issues recently, right? Is he doing okay now? I don't know. If, I don't know if he had health issues. I just saw him a few weeks ago, and he was fine. He was fine? So, okay. Yeah. I uh, threw out the first pitch at a baseball game with him. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Nice. Staying on, uh, just staying on that, Ken. That WrestleMania twenty three Money in the Bank. When did you find out you was actually going to win that match? The day before, I think, because originally wow. it was going to be Edge. Like the first couple days that we were talking, kind of planning things out, it was Edge, and then on like the second to last day, they came in and they had changed it to me. And I never, honestly, I didn't get excited about it because, like, you just said it, right? Believe, what, what was your quote? Believe. Believe nothing in what you hear and half of what you read. So I was like, you know, because how many times have they come up to you and said, hey, we're doing this, and you get excited about it, and then last minute it gets pulled. So I just try not to get excited about it. I didn't tell anybody about it. Exactly. So, yeah, that's happened. I, I sometimes I wonder if they purposely do it just to see how you're gonna act. You know, it's, fuck, everything's a test, right? Yeah. <sighs> fuck, Eddie's last match, dude. Yeah. Me. I exactly. I just, I mean, I mean, it sucks that that's his last match. It's cool in the sense that, like, I. I go down in history yeah. as having that sort of honor. Um, yeah. But I, he was just really cool to me, very helpful, always had some good advice. Always. Um, he so cared a lot. He cared a lot about, like, making sure that other people were good. You know, his philosophy was that if we're all good, the, sh the show is – even better instead of the mentality that you know there's two or three top guys and everybody else is just feeder he um and I, I found that was the case when i got to smackdown like across the board everybody wanted everybody to be good mm. Mm. You know, i miss him man that's one guy miss him miss him a lot loved you as a heel how did you come up with the green bay plunge Best finish around that you had fun breaking Bucktooth Bob's ribs. Oh, oh. so <laughs> Jesus. did you break his ribs for real? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So the thing, the thing about that finisher is that we have to be tight together. And right. to this day, after that, I don't know. I just, I just assumed that everybody would know that you have to like squeeze. And, and stay tight because if there's any separation between us when I hit and then, you know, or he hits and then I hit on top of him, that's when you have problems. Yeah. But he just, uh, I, I worked him on a pay-per-view. It was my very first pay-per-view. I think it was no mercy. And, um, he sort of let go or he wasn't as tight as he should have been. And so, yeah, he ended up breaking a rib. Um, and I, it's funny how I came up with that finisher. Austin Aries and I had worked each other a bunch and we went and worked for IWA mid South, which at the time was kind of a big, it was you know, a big deal at one point in time, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 So we got, 
we went and did their every year they would do the Ted Petty Invitational Tournament. Yeah. And we got booked for that. And I couldn't do a swan. I, I was doing the swan time, but somebody else on the show was already doing that. So, right. Yeah, I think it might have been his idea too. He's like, "Do you think you could hit me?" And so we worked on it, and uh, and I hit it, and it you know it went well. And then for some reason, I just never went back to it until mm. uh, Lagana came up to me and said, "Hey, we got to come up with a finisher for you." Cause you're going over it. Cause I couldn't do that because Jeff, that was Jeff Hardy's finisher. It's time. Right. It's time. So I just said, well, I've done this. It's a Finley roll. And Finley was our, was our producer. And he said, I, I said, I can do a Finley roll off the second. And I remember Funaki looked at me like, what? And I was <laughs> like, yeah, just, I promise I'll set you down gently. Just hang on tight. And he kind of looked at fit and like, he didn't know me from Adam, you know, like right. the only thing that he knew was he knew that he had seen me there a bunch of times yeah. and working and he trusted. He's like, all right, I trust you. And then, and then when we came back, he was like, you know, Oh, great, great. It didn't hurt. You know? So that was kind of how I came up with that. Sweet. Over 450 in the chat. Thank you so much. Please hit that like button. You're a popular guy, Ken. You're over, brother. Wait. Do you regret volunteering to go on Fox News? Absolutely, 100%. Please elaborate on that. I don't think I've seen that. What what happened? So, during the, uh, during the Ben Wathing, okay. for whatever reason, I felt like the world needs to really know what Ken Kennedy feels about this. And uh, I... I typed up this big long letter, basically putting the company over and how wonderful the company was and how stupid these people were on the news sources and, right. um, you know, sticking up for the company. Yeah. And um, it, it was just like, in the end, it was one of the worst decisions I've ever made in my life. And then I remember Vince calling me up and, and he said, uh, Hey, they want you to go on Fox news. Actually, I had been asked to go on like CNN and all these other news sources, but you know, Fox news was uh, a f considered friendly at the time. Right. So that was the one they decided to let me go on. Okay. But backfire. Yeah, it's just, it was, you know, that I remember before we went on the air, Martha McCallum, I think was the lady that interviewed me. She was super sweet and, I thought this is going to be great. And then the minute we went live, she was like, she asked me about Chris Benoit. And she's like, did you ever talk about steroids? Did you ever take them? Did you ever take them? And I was like, you know, I said something like I used to, and now I don't because, because of the wellness policy. And then nine days later, the signature pharmacies thing oh, came up. Oh. So, yeah. Timing, yeah. timing, timing, timing. Yeah. Kennedy, I was working with Sick Nick on his movie trailer. Okay, you got to tell me about this. What, what is this, Sick Nick? Do you know Sick Nick Mondo? He was a okay, hardcore okay. wrestler. Yeah, yeah. He does, um, I believe, like, he went to film school and... He went to film school here in the Twin Cities, and I was uh, like the main villain in his graduation, like his thesis or whatever, you know, like his last oh, project for, for graduation. Oh, um, sweet. So, I mean, sweet. He actually like shot a full, like it was a full production, low budget, obviously, but right. full production. Um, really cool. I like Nick a lot. He got a lot of, you know, at the time, hardcore wrestling was... And it's still to this, I think it's still this way to a certain degree that, you know, hardcore wrestlers are looked down upon. And yeah, I just, can't we all get along? You know, like everybody likes different stuff. I, I personally don't want to do the hardcore stuff, but I appreciate that are, there are people out there that do like it. 
he happened to be one of those guys, but also a really cool guy. And and I think he's now working. Last I heard, he was working with AEW on some of their, like he puts video packages together and stuff. That's another thing that's important to teach. Like I do seminars and stuff, and I'm saying, guys, you know, there's a, a strong chance that not all of you can make it as wrestlers, but you can find a trade that could help you be still be a part of the wrestling business, like film school, like writing, like whatever, camera tech, something. Yeah. And, you know, so if your dream is to work for WWE, okay, well, we can't all be the superstar main event at WrestleMania, but hell, none of us can be wrestlers, but you could be a referee. Look at Drake Younger. I don't know if you ever met Drake Younger. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Drake Wirtz. We were together in England. This is my post WWE, right? And he wrestled and he, he was a hardcore deathmatch wrestler, but he knew how to wrestle too. Yep. He ended up getting a spot as a referee. Had a, had a run there for 10 years. You know, bought a house, had kids, took care of them. Now he's successful at whatever. So that's another thing. It's, um, yeah. And who knows? You might be a, a camera guy and one day they say, hey, did you bring your boots and tights? We need an extra guy. Exactly. You never yep. know, right? You never do know. Um, it's funny you say that because I, I, I will give anybody an opportunity, like uh, pretty much for the most part. I got a lot of people from all walks of life, all varying degrees of athleticism, no athleticism that come in and want to try this. And I always like, if you, if you just said it, if you can't be a wrestler, there's, and you love this business and you want to contribute, there's something that you can do to contribute. Yeah. No matter what, you know. Yeah. 100%. Some of our, some of my guys have become promoters. So is that you something know? you do? You still run, you run shows along with the school, like little like spot shows, like student shows, or? I don't particularly run shows. I hate promoting. I'm, it's not my <laughs> <specialty>. <laughs> Um <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't I don't promote, but. Um, you know, I, I talk a lot about psychology yeah. and we train referees and we train managers and, um, I think it's important for a promoter to know, like most of the time when you, I would say that promoters are like big kids. When you were a kid, you played with the plastic figures and stuff and made wrestling matches happen in your basement. And now when they're older, they have a real ring and real people and they're doing the same thing. And, it, <clears throat> but, but a lot of times they just, they don't understand the psychology behind what we do. So they make these matches that are just like, as a, as a talent, you're like, what the fuck? How am I going to make sense of this? Right. Right. So I think it's important if those people actually have an understanding of what we do and how we tell those stories, you know, it makes it easier yeah. for everyone. Talking about promoting, you get this 2013 because my dad was a wrestler and promoter, right? And uh, 2013, I wanted to try it, so I did 30 shows in 30 days. It took years off my life. Holy cow! Yeah, was Mr. Kennedy supposed to be the person behind the limo explosion storyline? No, that wasn't you. It's Hornswoggle. I, I have no idea who that was supposed to be, honestly. I had no clue. Yeah, it was probably Orange Smuggle. It was. <laughs> Bastard. Uh, hold on a second. Here, we've got a good positive one. Jameson, could you read this? Yep, uh, you real can. Be right back. <laughs> DNA and WWE, I always wonder what would have happened if you got to cash in on Taker. Side note, any Benoit stories? <laughs> huh. You know, um, thank you for saying that. Um, it, it almost happened. I left, I left the SmackDown taping early one night and I got a phone call from Michael Hayes who said, Stephanie and Vince need to see you in their office. So I went back and, uh, I went in and, and they laid it out for me that Taker was hurt, that they needed to get the brief or they needed to get the title off of him. And that the next week, and they sort of laid out this whole scenario and uh i was going to cash it in on taker 
And I got injured the very next time that I wrestled on a house show. And I thought that I had torn my tricep. And it turned out to just be a, like a bruise. So I remember Stephanie calling me in my, my hotel room and she said, Ken, you tore your tricep. We're going to have to send you to Birmingham to get, you know, you tore it off the bone. You're going to have to have surgery and you're going to be out for like eight or nine months. However, we still need to get the title off the taker. So they sent, uh, they sent the jet to pick me up, flew me to Penn State, where Edge challenged me for the briefcase, and I put it up, and then, then he beat me for it. I remember, too, like on that day, I couldn't move my arm. My arm was completely taped up, if you look at that. And Vince was like, what can you do? And I was like, not much. And so I, it was my idea to have Edge jump me before the bell beat me up to roll me in the ring and just spear me when the bell rang. So it is what it is. Like yeah. I remember at the time thinking, you know, not the best thing in the world, but I'll be back and I'll, I'll get it later. You know, um, as the, far as, uh, Benoit, as far as the, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Was the original plan for that you was meant to cash it in that mania the following year? Was that the original plan? That was the original plan. As far as I know, that was what they right. had me say. You know, it, I think I cut a promo where I said I was going to cash it in the next year at WrestleMania. Yeah. And uh, that was the plan. And they had planned on having Taker. I don't know if they were planning on having Taker as the champ for that long or right. if there was going to be somebody else. But... Um, I remember when they called me in the office, they said, we plan on having Taker as our champion for a really long time, but, you know, he's injured and he's got to go away. And then okay. and then I remember Vince told me at the time, he said specifically, ben, uh, Batista is our guy, just so you know. Um, Batista is our guy, but we feel like he's, his stock raises whenever he's on the chase, when he's chasing the title, which is true for anybody, really. Yeah, any baby face, yeah. And uh, so they said, you know, if we feel like his stock is dipping, we'll take it off you and put it put it on Dave. But the, the thing about Benoit was um, I, I had some, some really good experiences with him. Again, fucking awful what he did, obviously. And that changes everything, I think. But... When I was there, he was always really cool to me and MVP. He kind of took both of us under his wing a little bit. And really, he would watch every one of my matches, and I would come back to the curtain, and he would be right there telling me, you did this well, this needs to be better. Um, he worked out with me. So I, I traveled with him briefly for like three or four weeks. And it was some of the most stressful stuff because I had to drive. It was him and it was Eddie and Chris. And I, when, when Chris agreed to it, because I asked him and he said, I'll, I'll talk to Eddie and I'll get back to you. And he came back to me about an hour later and he said, all right, we're cool with it. You're doing all the driving though. Which, of course, you know, of course I am. But those are some long, long nights when you get done with a house show. What? Call time for the house shows, I think, was 7 p.m. Right. Shows at 8. Show yeah. gets done at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. And those guys, Chris and Eddie, would sit in the locker room until, like, there would be, like, the janitor, the last janitor in the building going, can can you guys leave? No they shit. Would just sit, they'd sit there in the underwear and talk and drink drink a couple beers and stuff and just chit-chat. And uh, and then and then they'd have to get something to eat, so we would go find something that was open, Waffle House, and then I'd have like a two and a half, three hour drive to the next town, and I'd get in, and and then we would, you know, I'm standing here in the lobby at three three thirty in the morning, and they're trying to figure out like what the next day is going to look like, and I remember Eddie and Chris fighting over like what time we were going to get up and, the, and it ended up being uh and it, it wasn't a tv day mind you because tv days we had to be there at noon so it was like 
understood that we were going to have to get up early, but these were non TV days. It's three 30 in the morning and they would say, all right, we'll meet at seven 30 for breakfast. We'll have some breakfast and then we'll go to the gym. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's good for me. And, you know, and I'm fucking dying. <laughs> <laughs> so you're only working about four hours sleep then. Well, okay. less than that, because you think you, you don't just, you know, you never, at least for me, I can never just go in and drop my bags and fall into exactly. bed. Exactly. You know, I got to take a shower. I got to unwind and, yeah, wow. that's the part of the the wrestling business that the fans don't see. I had my my ex wife used to think that like I was just gallivanting around the country, like just having a gay old time, you know, with my buddy. And uh, you know, it was like our life was living in a hotel, working out. You know, we we're waiting in line. I remember Davari told me this one time before I got signed. He was like, your life is going to consist of standing in lines. You Steve stand Kern. in line. Steve Kern, we're professional that, waiters. We wait is that to what check he said? In. We wait, yeah, we wait to check in. We wait for our food. We wait to fucking, uh, for the other guys to get to the gym. We wait uh, airplane. Wait for everything. Wait for the show to start. We're professional yep. waiters. Yeah. That's the truth, man. Mr. Kennedy had one of the best entrances ever. Thank you. Uh, it was in the right there. place at the right time. That's it. We got to get through these because I know Ken wants to watch Raw. Another question for Ken. Could you talk about the Aces and Eight storyline you were a part of and how did it come about? Um, I really wasn't doing anything at the time at Impact. I think I had just come off an injury or something like that. And I remember uh, it was um, Eric Bischoff who said, hey, we're doing this thing. We we're thinking about throwing you in there. And I remember at the time I didn't complain about it, but in my head I was like, me being a biker, like it just doesn't. It's not you, right? Right. But I'll fuck it. I'll try it. You know, I want to be an actor. Like yeah. here's an opportunity for me to try something, step out of the box a little bit. Yeah. So I really, I ended up really enjoying it, and they really pushed the hell out of that that angle for a long time. Um, probably beat people over the head with it in in some instances. You know, like too much. When you, it, when Austin was at the height of his popularity, uh. you'd hear his, you'd hear the glass break one time a night, and. You know, there was just that buildup, like you couldn't wait until it happened. And then every once in a while, there would be a Monday Night Raw where he didn't, he wasn't there, and it would kill you as a as a viewer. At least it did me. Um, but the Aces and Eights, it was like they were hearing our music eight times a night. Sometimes, you know, it was just like overkill. <laughs> yeah, overkill. Yeah, but I really, really enjoyed enjoyed it. Enjoyed your time. I did. It's it's great seeing two ruthless aggression WWE alumni who made huge strides away from WWE. Kudos to Mr. Kennedy. I long lived the French tickler. Well, thank you, David. <laughs> you know that I, I just recently in the last year, year and a half, and I had never heard that term that we were in the ruthless aggression era. I think it was masters that told me. Really? Yeah. I mean, I had heard, I had heard the, the term because, wasn't that at the at the sign in on every show or something like that or? Well, I remember like, getting, I mean, some remember, Cena like, said. Yeah, Cena. Yeah, ruthless aggression. He had a promo with Vince or whatever, and then it was a ruthless aggression tour. I remember. I still have like sweaters when we toured Australia and stuff. The ruthless aggression tour and all that shit. Um, it was pretty ruthless. Backstage was pretty ruthless. <laughs> It definitely wasn't PG. Tough enough experience. <laughs> no. You yeah, tough, tough, enough? Enough, tough enough too. I went and tried oh, out. Shit. Oh yeah. Me. Yeah, were you there with the freaking Deacon? Were you there with Drew? Or was he a different year? I'm not sure. If he was, I didn't, you know, I didn't know him. Okay. Um, yeah, I went out there. I think I was the only person. That I knew, like I, I went out to to Vegas. It was in Vegas, 
Right. And I remember, what are you, what are you laughing about? My wife's laughing at me for something. All the, <laughs> my cat is sitting between my legs, like yelling at me. Okay. Um, but we, we went out there and I remember it was like really awkward. I got in the ring at one point and Al Snow was one of the judges and he said, I, it's, I see here that that you work in a nuclear power plant. Do you have any body parts that glow? And it was like a, <laughs> he sort of lobbed me a, a softball. And I wish at the time I would have fucking, you know, so I tanned with my underwear on. So my ass was white, bright white. I wish I would have yeah, turned around. Yeah, and, yeah this. <laughs> that I would have gotten hired on the spot, I guarantee. Probably. Um, I, I, I would have been in the running at least. Yeah. But I just completely flopped. And uh, it was a cool experience, but, uh, you know, you go and you do, a, like, a 15-minute tryout in the ring. I think they had us do some some bag drill. There was a dummy in the middle of the ring. You had to jump over and do a couple drop-downs and hit the ropes and so ask you to cut a promo. That would have been the year that Linda Miles and Jackie Gator won it? Yeah. Um, yeah. It was? Was it? Yeah. I know it was Chad Gaspard got hired that year. Okay. That's right. Yeah. He was, right. Yeah. He was one of the Rest in he peace. was one of the first guys that I met when I got down to OBW too. He was super cool to me from day one. Yeah. He was a good guy. Mm. Good dude. Favorite finisher to take? The tombstone. I like the schoolboy. It's <laughs> Nice and easy. MVP, MVP and I used to, uh, we'd argue, or Rochambeau, or fucking rock, paper, scissors, for who was going to take the choke slam, and okay. who was going to take the tombstone when we were working Kane and Taker, because the tombstone is just like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't hurt at all, you know, he's just, he just sets you down gently, whereas the choke slam, you got to jump, and they're already seven feet tall the way that it is, and yeah. Let me tell you this story, dude. So <laughs> it's me and Sly working Van Damme and Kane, right? It's the main event of Raw. <sighs> and this is where, like, we went over and Kane was about to transition to where he takes off his mask. Mm -hmm. Building up to it or whatever. Yeah. They told him to be extra aggressive, man. And he hit me with a choke slam at the end of the match, dude. As soon as I hit, boom, lights out. Really? Oh, yeah. And usually Glenn is fucking light as shit. Like, you know, yeah. The office built them up like this. You gotta be, you gotta be aggressive. You gotta be aggressive. You know what I mean? Because it was a big. I mean, because by that point he had had the mask for about what four or five years, right? So it was it's a been big, a long time. Yeah, it was a big deal for him to take it off. So they wanted him to change or whatever. And fuck. Anyway, looking good, Ken. Looking real good. What was your favorite TNA storyline you were involved in? Before that, do you have any Michael Hayes stories? <laughs> No, not really. I never, uh, I was never really close to him for some reason. I always thought like he hated my guts. Oh, I knew you hated mine. Yeah. I, yeah, I, not really. So I kind of avoided him as much as I could. Uh, yeah. Not, in a, you know, and looking back on it, it was just, it's probably me being just paranoid or something, you know. You, you, you kind of have that. He got mad at me one time because I was wearing a Lynn Skinner t-shirt. Told me to take it off. Really? Yeah, because in his mind, he thinks he's a free bird, like a legitimate, like a Lynn Skinner member, I guess. Sure, sure. So, yeah. But back to the question. What was your favorite TNA storyline? Probably the the one with Bubba. Well, there was a, there was a couple of them. My, my angle was Kurt Angle. It was one of the first ones that I had when I got there. And it led to probably my favorite match that I've ever been a part of, which was Kurt Angle in a steel cage at lockdown in nice. 2009. That, yeah. But but also um the sting the sting angle was really fun because I got to dress up as Surfer yeah. Sting and Oh, I remember that. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and like the little kid in me, the fan, you know, you we talked earlier about not acting like a mark, but like you are still a mark and, and deep yeah. down inside, we're all marks. 
Yeah. We like this so much that we'd want to do it. Right. Um, and so Sting painted my face. He actually would paint my face every day. And I, I wore, he brought gear for me to wear like his old stuff. So it's kind of, kind of cool. I remember as a fan, like he was doing the crows thing and I was like, come on, man. I want to see the bleach blondes thing come back as a, you know, a teenager watching. Whatever. I was the same way. I, I preferred the bleach blonde. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like the all-American. Ken, do you have any stories about Notorious But Oh, ever see him in a mesh shirt? <laughs> uh, I've seen him in a mesh shirt, but I don't really have any, no, nothing nothing crazy. nothing crazy. He was always kind of quiet. And, yeah. Mm. Yeah. What do we got here? What a question. That was yeah. a hell of a question. Mr. Kennedy, had you had an encounter with the shower boogeyman, Michael Hayes? If so, what do you ever attempt to do back rake on you? Okay, so I, I'm going to tell you this story. So we have Paul London on here, and um, it's a very famous story on this channel. Him and Brian Kedrick had finished up a match, right? And they're in the shower, and they're showering, talking about their match, and all of a sudden they slowly felt some something, a presence, staring at them. And as they slowly turned, they looked to their left, Michael Hayes was leaning on a column, staring at them, and he uttered the words, looking good, boys, looking real good, <laughs> and he walked off. So Paul told that story on this channel, and we actually printed out T-shirts and sold them. Looking good, boys, looking real good. <laughs> <laughs> With that deep voice that he has. Hey, Kenny, did you see the shoot where Bob said how he liked to torture you? Oh, I seen it. Barry, you yeah, with Mr. Alabama man. Yeah, did you guys patch things up? We did. Okay. And the, the thing was, is like before all that occurred, we were we were pretty close. Like we rode together. Uh huh. Um, there was a period of time where it was like me, him, and Randy that were really? riding. Yeah, every week, Santino and uh, Cody Rhodes would sometimes jump in that car too. Um, but. Then that, that whole thing kind of went down. Um, for whatever reason, he thought for a long time that I had something to do with him getting fired, which I didn't. I went out of my way to, like, you know, to keep locker room stuff in the locker room. Right. Um, but, yeah, I just – I ran into him maybe two or three years ago at a show, and we, you know – Everything got kissed. patched up. Everything's cool. We kissed and hugged and – Kissed and hug and had a little together. cry together. Fluffy ducks. <laughs> All right. How was it working, Benoit Batista and Undertaker? I mean, all positive. Yeah, all, all positive. I remember the first time I wore Taker was in Oklahoma City on a house show, yeah. and he just wanted to get a feel. Right. He like. Uh, he told me in the back, he said, I'm not, we're not going to call anything in the locker room. Just listen to me out there and just see how it goes. And I remember just, I knew that I, that he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to blank out there. And I really didn't have to think about anything. I just had to listen to him, mm. you know? So it was so freeing and uh, it was a positive experience. I just did what he told me to do, tried to do it to the best of my ability. And then, came back and he was like, I liked it. And then the next night he let me call a spot, put something in there and then just kind of went from there. But I, we were married for a, a long time. It was like a combination of me, him, MVP, Kane and Batista for like a year. But I, I really enjoyed it. Big I Dave, too, like I'll, I'll say, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please, please, please. No, I, I, Big Dave was like, so giving. Um, my first big major match was against Dave at the Great American Bash in 2007. And it was like, a, I remember getting to the building and thinking, well, because they had given me a pretty good push up to that point. And I remember thinking, well, tonight it ends. You know, they're going to just basically have Dave squash me. Mm. And uh, Arn was our producer. And I said, what kind of like, he goes, oh, this is a competitive match. It's going to be like, you know, so. How much time they give you? 
12, 13, 14, something like that. It was a decent amount of time. Decent amount of time, yeah. And uh, I remember I asked because Dave was just coming off an injury. Mark Henry had put him out of action for like eight months with a tricep. I think he tore his triceps or something like that, wrestling Mark. And uh, so he's supposed to be coming back pissed off. Now he can't wrestle Mark. So they stick me in his way, and I thought he was just going to run through me. Mm. And I thought in the process he was going to, you know, be very violent. He's pissed off. He's been gone for so long. So I asked Vince, can I get some color? Because I felt like it, it just made sense there, right? I asked, can I get some color? And no. And the reason was, was that Taker was working the great Kali in a – Punjabi prison match. And so they were going to get some color. He needed all the help he can get, right? And well, but but Taker wanted to get color and they didn't want, you know, we were like two matches away from each other. You know how it is. Like, of course. They, of course. If yeah. they want color, they want it like one time a night, right? That's it. Needs so the, we, we got going and I rolled out of the ring. He came out after me and he ran me into the apron and then he ran me into the steps. And when I hit, I like split the uprights and I bounced my head right off the edge of the steps. And I could tell him, I was like, I'm bleeding. And I got in the ring and he was like, damn, dude, are you okay? And I could already start feeling coming. And I had like the greatest crimson mask throughout that match. And then at the end, he, he loses his shit and he posts me three times and then three spine busters. Like he... He got counted out at some point, right? He wouldn't break the five count in the corner. Okay. And that first post, he run, he ran me so hard, and I couldn't move out of the way, and I, my head hit the, the turnbuckle or the post so fucking hard. Um, and I instantly started like I have a scar like right Ooh! here. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. And uh, I just it was like a faucet. It, it was like somebody turned a faucet and I was just covered in blood and it turned out to be one of the best things that's ever happened in my career. Because when I came back to the curtain, Vince was like, yes, are you okay? Uh, yeah, I'm okay there. That, that's a picture of it right there. There's a spot right there when he, he like pushes me out. My head's a little bit closer to the mat and you can just see like a trickle of blood coming off coming off my head, just pouring onto the... Doesn't onto the Dave look like a big tarantula there? <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> Awkward-looking motherfucker. Yeah, but it was like, I came back to the curtain, and Vince was like, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Said, yes. Uh, you know, and just the fact that I hadn't given up or complained about it or whatever, you know, you know how they are. Right. But if, well... The fact You're that a fucking was, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was Taker <laughs> pissed though because you took away from his match? No, because he knew that it wasn't intentional. You know, exactly. everybody knew that it wasn't. Right, right. And it definitely wasn't intentional. It just happened. Were you knocked out from that post shot though? Concussed? For a second, but you know, in hindsight, with what we know about concussions now, I I worked like the next night or two nights later, they just stitched me up and. That's the way it was. Van Dam yeah. knocked me out. Van Dam hit me with a spin kick, knocked me out for seven hours on a Sunday. I was back in the ring the next night. Nineteen years old. Your brain's not fully developed till you're twenty-five. Just oh, saying. Yeah. 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 Thoughts on the jizz? I mean, Miz. <clears throat> I I think it's great. Um, I when I got there. He was just coming up to because he was on Tough Enough. The, he was on the Million Dollar Tough Enough, right, with Pewter. Right. And for some reason, at that time, people hated him because his path to the WWE wasn't the same as everybody else's. Like that yeah. A or Do's thing. He he was a TV star basically, and he got you know, he won a competition or he was part of a competition and everybody was like, oh, he hasn't paid his dues, fuck him. And it's kind of funny. I've, I've never understood that mentality because 
if any one of those people that complain about him and the way that he got there would have been given that opportunity, are you telling me that they would have said, no, no, thanks, but no thanks. I got to go toil away on the Indies for a couple more years. Like, no, they would have taken that fucking, they would have taken that opportunity. Right? But uh, there was some, he did get bullied. I, I know he's talked about it, but I, I saw him, I witnessed him getting bullied. I remember one time somebody dumped a bunch of like lotions and stuff into a into a Ziploc bag and stuck it under his bedroom door at the hotel and stomped on it. So it like sprayed all over the inside of his room, like stuff like that. It was really like mean ribs. Do you uh do you not like him? No. I like him. No, you don't? No, I like him. Oh, okay. I like his wife more. Do you have any stories of Melina or Mickey James? <laughs> Would you like to give Kennedy experience to? Come on, buddy. Melina or Mickey James? Um, no. No. His wife's there, Thank fellas. You. Jesus Christ. What kind of questions are you asking here? He's a married man. <laughs> hey, boys. Quick question. No. Uh -uh. Definitely not. Definitely not. Well, we're professionals here. We keep business and fucking separate. Did you prefer being on SmackDown compared to Raw? I did. I really? did. Um, yep. I don't know. It was just like when I was there, and I, I know people have said, you know, Hunter is a different person today. Sean's a different person today than he was back then. Well, Hunter's, about, when I, Hunter's about to get divorced if what we're fucking reading here is true. <laughs> right. But in some of the people, some of the people that are still there that I still talk to from time to time yeah. say that he's a completely different person now. And that the good things that have happened in the WWE over the last like five to ten years have mostly been a result as a result of, of him, you know, really? allowing people to do stuff like the NXT stuff, you know, that was his baby. And um well, hold on, I want to debate you there for a second. Yeah, yep. You know, the good things that happened for the boys is the fact that they got the Saudi deal, the fact that they got the Fox contract, which they now lost, but they're going back to Raw for more money. So, I mean, that's what really brought the money up. So whoever, you know, did those deals is probably the reason why the guys are making more money, right? And the fact that Tony Khan's willing to spend his dad's money on a promotion. Yeah. Right, right. There's a legitimate competition or opposition to where guys have, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But, but I think um, the fact that NXT was taken so seriously, you know, what like Vince, when was. Vince was running things, he would always sort of like uh, when he took over ECW. I felt like oh. it wasn't his. Everybody was always saying like it wasn't his baby, so he doesn't care about it. And he wants to kind of kill it off and. Um, uh, I'll debate you on that as well. Here's the thing, right? Yeah. You, know, you know, you've been in the business. You know how expensive it is, WWE production is. Mm -hmm. So imagine, okay, ECW, I think you'd agree, what made that special was the fan interaction, right? And the smaller venues, like the Hammerstein Ballroom. Yep. The Elks Lodge. Yep. Couldn't get that same feel in the big arenas that WWE promoted. Yep. Right. Agree. Okay. Yeah. But right. The cost, the cost to do a whole new television production in those venues would be millions. Yeah. So why go to that extra cost when he would just, you know, he just put it in the arenas? So that that's I think what was missing was that you'd have to pay millions of dollars and tape it and take a whole other day to travel to a different venue, pay all the production people, set it up. And but just don't do it then, you know, like true, true. But it I think Rob, I think Rob actually Van Damme went on record saying that he's the one that actually convinced uh Vince to actually do the first pay-per-view, like the one night stand, and that was that was incredible. It was incredible, but again, yeah. the old venues, right? Yeah. The Hammerstein Bowl. Yeah, the Hammerstein, yeah. Yep. Yep. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you never uh, how many how many tapings of the original ECW were in a major arena? 
None. I, I don't. I don't believe there was any. No, there was none. It was all the smaller type venues. Yep. You know, three thousand, two to three, four thousand, maybe. You know, hell, the ECW arena only holds about what a thousand people. Yeah. 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 Right? yeah. Yep. And those are the hardest of the hardcore fans. But so you watch ECW on like, uh, well, basically it was like the same arenas that we taped SmackDown, right? It was the same day. Yeah. Just yeah. And here's another thing. I think they taped it after SmackDown. So the crowd has already seen two or three hours worth of wrestling. They're they don't want to see any more. Yeah, they're kind of getting sick of it. So that's what that's the product you're getting across to you on television, right? Well, and then and then at the time they were doing like Kind of goofy stuff. Remember they had like a zombie. Yeah. And but that that what from what I heard was because of the network. It was a yeah. sci-fi network, and they needed some type of sci-fi horror. I think there was like horror shows, so they needed that to be incorporated with it. So that's what the zombie was all about. Yeah. There's a lot of things, man. Like even us as wrestlers, I was kept in the dark by a lot of things where I just didn't ask any questions, and you wonder why the hell are you doing that? But like. Sly, you know, my old partner, he was like an agent there for a little bit. Okay. He was an agent there for a little bit. He's like, Renee, if, if you're in these meetings, you wouldn't believe. It's nothing like we think it is. It's yeah. Nothing, yeah. He, I was just talking to him about that last week. Right. And he said, like, yeah, he, he said that he finally realized that it's not a personal thing. Like, when, when somebody gets booked – for a squash match, you know, you're a good, you're a good worker, but like for this night, we need, we need somebody to, to get squashed and it's not a personal thing. Right. And we always tend to look at it as a, what did I do wrong kind of situation. Right. So much fucking paranoia, right? But, but the other thing I will say about the, like the Hunter stuff, total, so much paranoia. That, and that was, I feel like that was by design to some degree, right? Like they've, they kind of thrive on that. They want people to walk on eggshells and to sort of be tentative all the time. And keep you up never know. Keep up productivity. Keep you never know when you hard. never know when you're going to get that call. You know. That's it. That's it. Um, but but I will say the thing about like Hunter. I know that like small stuff like the boys being able to run Twitch. You know, a lot of the guys had Twitch channels and stuff, and. Vince put the kibosh to that, and as soon as Vince was out of the picture, Hunter said, "We're bringing all that stuff back, you guys. You know, give him a little more freedom. Um, there's less, you know. I've heard stories, and I've experienced this where the rewrites are happening in the third hour of Raw, and we still don't know what we're going to do in the main event of Raw because Dude, Vince like has rewritten the show thirteen times." What's that? Yeah. It's like the, the WCW in his dying days. And and now when when Vince was removed from that, it was like you know, two rewrites maybe. Or, oh. or and and everybody was sort of given a lot more freedom to hey, you guys know what you're doing. I'm not gonna micromanage you and tell you exactly what to do here and so just go out there. Here's where you know they give you like a bullet point, couple bullet points, and here's where we need to get to. You figure out how to get there on your own. And that's that's the best way to do it for the talent. Thank you. Yeah, yep. because we're artists. Like we are artists. We are. And this is an art form. And when you're not allowed to be creative, it's it's it sucks. Yep. You're just a puppet. You're just a robot. All right, point me in the right direction. Tell me what tell me what you want me to do. Clock in, clock out, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. And it should it like? be that way. It's the coolest job in the world. It is. It is the coolest job. When when it's going good and everything, business is good, and it is the coolest job in the world. Okay, third bathroom break. Jameson. <clears throat> yep, last couple of questions. Uh, John Adams, thank you. What was it like taking Angle's moon so off the cage? Great spot. Um, one, I, I was telling my students this the other day, there are certain people in the business where I trust them fully. Like if they're going to give me a super kick or something like that, like I won't bother putting up a, a hand or anything like that or turn my head at all. He's one of those guys that he's so good and 
So I was never nervous about it. Um, and he barely touched me, actually. He, wow. Yeah. Barely touched me. The funny thing about that was that he told me before we went out there that he was going to do that to me, but we couldn't tell. D'Lo Brown was our agent, and we couldn't tell him that because he said, they're never, you know, they'll never, the office will never allow me to do that. They'll tell me no. So we're, we're just going to do it. And when we come back and they ask you, I'll just say that I just felt it in the moment and I went up there and did it. Nice. <laughs> uh, another TNA question here. Uh, working with Heal, Jeff Hardy. Mm. It was really tough. And I worked him a lot on house shows at that time. And people want to love Jeff Hardy. It's it's hard to yeah. dislike him. You know, I remember when he turned on me at uh, was it Slammiversary? Uh, Bound for Glory. Big Bound for Glory. Bound for Glory. He hit me with the... were using Kurt, yeah. Which, at the end of it, he, he hits me with the crutch. Which, by the way, was not gimmicked in any way. And it was probably the most painful thing I've ever taken in the business. Wow. Um, but I, I liked, I just liked working with Jeff, but it was a challenge working with him as a, as a heel. Yeah. Because we would go into these arenas and even though he was slated on paper, he was the heel and I was the baby face. They were cheering for him because it's, it's Jeff Hardy. Yeah. It was a uh, hard as a fan to boo him. And I'm like, it's Jeff. He's just so beloved. <laughs> yeah. It was like Austin. Remember when they turned, when they first turned Austin heel, and yeah. it didn't work. It didn't yeah. work. They, the fans were still cheering him, and then they had him like wearing people out with folding chairs. And then finally, he he started doing it to women. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was the one night when he was he was just laying into Lita, wasn't it? The one night him yep. and Triple H. Yeah. Yeah. That finally got him some booze. <laughs> um, let's see. Can you do a Mister Stud Muffin? Stud Muffin. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe sometime. Uh, sometime. <laughs> uh, no. Michael's wrestling channel. Hello, guys. Uh, quick question for Ken: How did you feel about being in a WWE video game? That's a good question. I've been a gamer my whole life, so to me, that was uh, just one of the coolest things in the world. I remember doing the when I first when they first approached me with my lines because there was some storyline stuff in the video games. That's right. And so uh, they would, uh, once a year, they would bring a, a trailer. It would be like a mobile sound studio. And I'd go out there and you just, there was a big TV and you'd read your, they, somebody would read the line before you. And then um, I just remember having a ton of fun with that. And with the vi with an action figure, that kind of stuff was like, you know, it's still sort of surreal to me to this day that there's all these action figures and I was in a couple of video games. And But I will say that as big of a gamer as I am, I don't like wrestling games. I don't like wrestling games at all. And uh, I couldn't wait to like see it when I was, I think it was 2006 was the first one that I was involved in. Yeah, you and I played it for SmackDown versus Raw. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it was 2006 or 2007. Yeah. And uh, I played it for 10 minutes and I was like, I'm done. Uh, and I never touched it again. I've never played. I've never played no. myself. Never. I'm not good at video like games. I get mad. You like the paychecks, didn't you, Renee? What? <laughs> you like the paychecks, the video game paychecks. Oh, I love the fucking paychecks. Probably, yeah. I gave the paychecks were fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That was stupid. Yeah. Yeah. It was fucking nice. All right, dude. Let's promote your school, Badass Wrestling School, Ken Kennedy. Where, where is it? Where can we find you? We're in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and we've got a website. It's the academy, SOPW.com. Um, if you want to, it, again, we talked about this earlier, but if somebody out there wants to get into the business, they might not live in the Twin Cities area. I would like to help you and get you situated and get you to the right, one of the right schools. Um, 
you can text me at 507-722-2776. Um, that comes to my phone, it comes to my wife's phone, and uh, we'd love to, you know, we'd love to help, help people out. We've got several of our students that have already made it to AEW or WWE, or one of our students is the NXT Women's Champion right now, Tiffany Stratton. I think she's still the oh, champion, right. isn't she? I think she just Jesus lost at the Becky. Christ. Did she lose it? Yeah, but I don't know who she is. Great talent. The fucker. I don't know who she is. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ken, there's been some local promoters here asking for you, so uh, just keep checking your messages. I might have some. You still take gigs, right? Yes, sir. All right. We'll keep, your, keep your Facebook on, so I might have some work for you. All right. All right. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so okay, much. Well, yeah. All right. Thank you for having you on. You've been a great guest, and uh, we'll talk soon, my friend. All right, brother. All right, this Thursday, this Thursday, Paul London returns to the cafe. Order of Altamont. Bye bye.